Welcome to the IPX True North podcast, where we connect people, processes, and tools. Welcome back to our ecosystem evolution series. Uh, again, uh, joined by uh, Dr. Nathan Hartman. Nate, thanks for uh, joining us again. Uh, looking forward to today. This, this part of the series, we're going to be talking about organization operating models. Uh, really looking forward to uh, discussing this with you. There's a lot here to peel back. I, I, I think this will probably be a two or three part a series just on the operating models. But Nate, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me again, Joe. And I uh, look forward to today's uh, discussion. So I'm just going to get it kicked off. Um, much like we were talking about with the organizational change management, and you know, I'm, eventually it'll stop sounding like a broken record. There's a lot going on in industry, regardless of the industry that you find yourself in. And, and at times we all act like we're different, but at the end of the day, we either design and or manufacture products or or we design and or manufacture a service, right? And I think it's important to look at it that way. A lot of people don't talk about a service as far as the design and the manufacturing of those elements, but a lot goes in to the service side of the house. So just wanted to throw that out there. Mm-hmm. Um, from my perspective, right now, you know, we hear a lot of uh, digital transformation, transformation as continuous improvement. But there's a lot going on. And, and if, if organizations aren't reevaluating their operating models, they're going to get left behind. And I, and I think there's, there's things we've seen over the last couple of years. You know, we've seen them over the last two decades. But honestly, the last two years, I want to put some focus on, um, but are a bit concerning. Uh, when you look at recalls, which I'm going to get into in a little while, when you see quality escapes, uh, when you see upper echelon companies go from you know, the top of the bar to, you know, bankruptcy within two months. I mean, it's, it's pretty interesting. And I think a lot of that is um, of course the operating model accountability within the organization from a leadership down. Um, But I really want to peel that back, Nate. And I also want to couple that with, as you know, our CM2 DNA platform, our, our end to end ecosystem DNA platform that, you know, traceability and interoperability uh, model and methodology. And I see you got your CM2 shirt on today. Um, I would say we're, we're twins, but I'm, I'm actually wearing my CM2 uh, brief. So I can't show those on video and I'm sure our audience don't want to hear that, but it's nice to see that. And as you know, this is something that's been uh, near and dear to my heart prior to uh, my current role. You know, I was a, a supporter and a practitioner of CM2, uh, for the last 20 years. So there's a lot there. And I think there's a a great opportunity to utilize such a model to evaluate your operating system. So Nate, I just said a lot, but given the pace of change and and the potential uh, disruptors in the industry, where do you see executives struggling to determine where to place their bets, where to invest and when to do it? You know, so that's, I want to start there at that kind of, again, at that executive level, much like we did with our OCM series. Mm -hmm. So yes, Joe, you did say a lot. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) The, you know, so from my perspective, again, I'll I'll maybe bound this just slightly by saying um, that, you know, this isn't um, necessarily in my mind, an answer that's geared towards say betting the long-term financial or social viability of the company as much as it is uh, sort of a focus on day-to-day operations that get you to your your longer-term goals. You know, you mentioned, uh, you know, the CM2 model uh, and the the CM2 DNA for, for processes, and you mentioned specifically interoperability and traceability, and I think those are two key things that executives um, you know, current and, and, uh, you know, just barely into the recent past, uh, but certainly into the, into the future are going to have to deal with, um, you know, things like that historically often did not make it to the, uh, to those topics, those discussions, those strategies, those decisions often didn't make it to the executive suite, uh, in whatever, CXO's office, you know, you might want to consider. They often didn't make it there because it was it it was beneath, uh, figuratively speaking, that level of the organization to deal with. They it was considered much more operational, 
And today, I'm not sure that's the case, or at least I, I think the case is beginning to shift. You know, you talked about business models. You talked about operational models. Think about things that have happened in um, other industries, right? The motion picture industry, the music industry, the publishing industries. You know, we still have content that we read and that we listen to and that we watch, but yet the dissemination mechanism is so different. Uh, you know, the platforms that have been stood up. Look at things like Uber or Lyft. Those things are not successful because somebody all, this, all of a sudden discovered that we have cars, right? It's The idea is that because we have connectedness of our information, because we have interoperability and traceability of certain kinds of data, because we can put that information into a rather easy and seamless interface for people to digest, that's what's made those things successful. Uh, and at the same time, given rise to new business kinds of models. You know, you and I both worked in former lives in the manufacturing industry. And, you know, for a long time, it was you sold your product and kind of went like this. And, and it was the buyer's issue to deal with traceability, to deal with interoperability, to deal with service, to deal with warranty, to deal with repair. Um, but yet now products in some cases are no longer sold as capital assets, if you will. They're sold as services. You know, I might buy the, um, the product. It could be a car. It could be a plane. It could be an engine, it could be a toaster, I suppose. But, but you know, the point is, is that I don't, you know, and, and we're seeing this social shift, right? And the fact that I don't necessarily want to own the artifact or the, or the product. I don't want to have to invest in the ownership in some cases. I just want to invest in, or I just want to pay for, or I just need the product when I need it. I need, I need the capability or the I need what it does for me. I don't necessarily need to own it per se. And so having a business model like that requires that you have different kinds of information, that you have different kinds of internal processes. It requires that you have arguably a different way of thinking for your workforce uh, and probably a different way of thinking uh, for your executives in terms of managing you know, the long-term health and viability of the organization. And so, you know, when, it, when we talk about these operating models and, and, and how they're different, um, we have things rising to the executive level now that, that historically had never risen there. And so uh, we have to, uh, you know, the collective we has to somehow uh, address that. You know, and I, I, I want to couple that, you know, from a manufacturing standpoint, you and I are aware of the, the life cycle phases, right? From concept to decommission. And what I'd like to do is focus on this next few minutes talking about kind of the as needed to the as enabled or the as produced, right? So yeah. have an idea, I'm gonna vet that idea and then I'm gonna to work towards producing that idea or go live with that idea, regardless if it's manufacturing or not. Um, but let's just let's just start there. So and, and you touched on a, a great thing with Uber and Lyft, right? There was there was a need and they vetted that need and then they, they went to they went to market with that where where I think a lot of organizations are struggling. And it's a service model, right, from a production standpoint. So now. I could sell a product or I could sell a service that has a product associated to that. Um, you know, let's let's use the toaster example. Um, you know, it's a great one. Everyone wants a perfect piece of toast. Um, I don't need a toaster with the TV on it. I need a toaster that gives me the toast exactly how I want it. If I'm going to purchase a, a toaster or a service to give me perfect toast, that means the producer of that toaster must have the capability or the algorithms to understand the individual need, right? I like my toast a little crispy, so I'm like, there's chewy. Um, that's complex because, you know, yes, we have products out there today with a lot of options and variants, right? I could, I could go into a sales configurator on someone's website 
and I can design my perfect phone. It could have everything custom, every brand, every color that I want that I can imagine. And I'll pay for that. But the capability for the most part is going to be what's offered from the manufacturer and what's offered from the service providers that create the apps. Um, from an operating model standpoint and from a business model, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of slow pitching towards this recall discussion I want to have here in a minute. And I'm, and I'm doing this carefully. Uh, yeah. How do these companies that have been around for 20, 20 or 30 years adjust, right? They're so used to that serial production and that mentality of we're going to produce, yeah, whatever, you know, it's the old Henry Ford model, right? You can have any color of vehicle you want as long as it's black. Yeah. Um, and, and in many ways that hasn't changed, right? And and we we kind of mask that with, some variation, but the reality is form function and, you know, outside of some of the outliers, it's, you're going to get our product and this is how it's going to work. Right. And I promise you it's going to do this. And if you're not happy about it, we promise you and a few releases to update that. But from concept to production, I really want to focus here because I think this is going to go to my next segue, which is recalls. Yeah. Where do you see the greatest need of change from that, that initial idea until the time I produce it? You know, to me, I think um, maybe a couple different spots. One is, you know, writing requirements is hard. You know, writing good, valid, um, achievable, uh, auditable requirements it is a challenge. It's, it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. And uh, because to some degree, it requires you to be able to look, look into the future to see what might possibly happen uh, with whatever product it is, uh, or service it is that you're, that you're defining. And, and, and again, it's not always an easy thing to do, because there are so many variables that affect what happens when that once that product leaves sort of this its design or definition stage and goes into production you know there are um supply chain issues there are tooling issues there are workforce issues there are environmental issues there are you know fill in the blank there, there's all kinds of issues and then certainly when that that product leaves production and goes into into use wherever that is you know there's all kinds of other uh issues that come into play and so as a as a manufacturer you have less and less control of the function of that product the farther and farther you get from the requirements definition stage and so to me that's one big thing is is i think you know we as a community have to get better at writing requirements. I think we have to get better at uh, validating whether those requirements have been met. Uh, I think we have to get better at developing our contractual mechanisms to account for the fact that we can gather performance data and develop um, projections and develop um, you know, regression models and predictions and the like from those things. And, and I think right now, you know, we have challenges within our, uh, say, legal and, and, and case law uh, kinds of communities there where, you know, for better or for worse, their area, their community, their disciplines are just now beginning to, to contemplate those, those sorts of things. Um, a second area that I see is, is how you know design to, to get to a product is usually an iterative process. You don't just design it and then go make it and everything's fine, right? There is, is some amount of iteration in that, that process. And I think one of the things we have challenges with is capturing those iterations in a, a form, whether it be digital or otherwise, um, in a form that makes them readily accessible that allows them to be seen in a way in a in a context driven way as opposed to just these sort of sterile iterations that 
you know, ultimately didn't get chosen as the as the go forward solution. And so um, there's a lot of historical decision making, a lot of a lot of nuanced discussion, usually that goes with those those iterations of a design before somebody gets to whatever the final choice is. And there's not good ways to capture that and have it be reflected in the um, sort of the the systems engineering view of the world, if you will, um, which is often where you know requirements get defined. Uh, and so, so I guess for now, I would say you know those two areas I think are are things that that companies need to to work at, um, not just on the sort of the the end user side, if you will, but also. You know, we need our, our software community to come along with us and, and give us tools and capability to do that, right? We need our R&D communities, you know, whether they be university-based or whether they be uh, government-based or, or even industrially-based, we need more R&D into um, systems, into data representations, not just data presentations, but actual data representations, system representations. We need more uh, development around um, machine learning capability. Uh, you know, not to say that we're going to get to this sort of global artificial intelligence anytime soon, but but certainly we're starting to see applications for machine learning that that you know we didn't have uh, five years ago or even two years ago. And so, um, you know, we we need the the convergence of those things to come together to help us develop better requirements that 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 don't force us to essentially stop at some small relatively speaking set of options for people to pick right that we can in fact have uh more customized if you will kinds of of products and services you know i'm gonna just like you said, you said a lot there. So I've got to, I got to track back on some of this. Um, and as you know, this one is, this one's near and dear to me. This one's a passion kind of project. Mm -hmm. so when you're talking about requirement traceability, requirement writing, um, communication, change of those requirements across the ecosystem. So not just internally to your organization, but your suppliers, your, your consumers, the regulatory officials, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and you see a lot of companies um, celebrating with big banners on their side of their building that they're compliant with a certain standard or they're four, four star this or gold this or silver that. And not that there's anything wrong with those models, but I, I think it's, you know, this is me. This is Joseph Anderson speaking, everyone. I want to make it very clear before I go on. It's just my perspective. Um a lot of that's just uh, superficial. It's smoke and mirrors. Um, you, how how can a company um, that just released a major quality recall um, be celebrating that they are 100% compliant with a, a certification? What's that say about the assessors, the 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 audit, the the actual? inner workings of an organization. So this one's always been a big one for me and, and requirements management and a um, quality management platform, not just a system. A lot of people will say they have a QMS uh, system. That's just software that supports your processes and stores your requirements. If your requirements are garbage, garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, if the linkages to requirements that you're enforced to follow aren't clear, concise, and valid, CM2 mantra. Um, sorry for the little plug there. You're going to get a few of those today. And I, I typically try to avoid that, but this one's important. Um, if those requirements aren't clear, concise, and valid, you're set up for failure, not success. Or you're set up at least for um, an investment in intervention resources, right? Um, and I, I, think that's, I think that's how a lot of companies survive is it's intervention resources. It's, it's all of those things that you weren't going to spend money on to make sure you get your product out the door uh, successfully. So on time, and I said that in quotes for those of you that can't see me, uh, on time's a bit of a a joke with me. Um, we throw an arbitrary, arbitrary date out and we try to hit it and then we miss it and spend millions and millions of dollars um, to get something out there. And then of quality, and, and I'm going to go off on this one a little bit. 
of quality, there used to be a time that companies stood by quality. I mean, it was their mantra. I mean, it, and, and a lot of products built back during that time were, were good and still survive today. They might not have all the fancy software and some of the capabilities and functionality that you can get uh, that, you know, a modern tech, technological evolutions brought us, but the quality was good um, and companies stood by that. And I'm going to say something that I think a lot of executives wouldn't say. Um, I, I, ver I see very few companies sticking by quality and actually come out and saying, we're going to give you a, a product and we're going to put our name on it. We're going to guarantee quality and it's not going to be a smoke and mirrors warranty. It's, it's not going to be a warranty process that when you look at the steps to actually get it, to fill it out, you just throw it in the trash because you're not going to spend two weeks filling out an application so a company can guarantee their product. So for me, when we're talking about from this as needed to production and we're talking about requirements management that and, and how we communicate design those iterations how we go into production, all of that, it, the intent, the intent. Yeah. I know there's a lot we get, we got to make sure we're making money on this. It's got to be, uh, we got to have a demand for it. It needs to be marketable, but the intent of producing and shipping that product should be, I'm shipping something that I know is good goods. Um, and, and maybe there's some outliers there, but I'm telling you right now, I, and I don't know if it's a complacency in the market, um, with consumers, they're just used to getting products that only survive a year or two and they throw it in the trash or they, they donate it. Um, I don't know if we've gotten so used to seeing major recalls that we've been mm -hmm. complacent, but this one really, you know, to me, it hits you right in the face. And you, like you mentioned, you've got these, we've got software needs, we've got uh, internal needs, and that's where, you know, our, the CM2 uh, digital uh, standards, CM2-600, that's where we are able to vet digital solutions and how they manage requirement traceability, interoperability, and communication. And when you got Dash 500, that's how we can assess the as-is state of an ecosystem of any organization and define your to be state. I see a need for investment there and an honesty within organizations that we need a one, stop just throwing money at new tools because we do that all the time. We think a new tool is just going to magically solve our problems. But the reality is, and, and Nate, I think you know this better than anyone, most of the time the tool providers are forced to configure and or customize the tool based off of legacy processes. Because at the end of the day, that's their customer. If a customer yeah. says, you know what, I know you say the button should be red, but we want it blue because it's always been blue. And that might seem trivial, but when you start talking about workflows and processes, that starts to compound a problem. So my next question, saying a lot here, Nate, and as you know, this is this is a big one for me. What are we going to do? And I spend a lot of time every week. I look at the recalls. I mean, you could check out recall.gov. You could go to each agency, medical devices. You could go to NHTSA. So you could see everything from aerospace, to automotive, to uh, nuclear, to healthcare. You could see the recalls that are going on and it's daunting. And then when you dissect them, uh, again, I'm a bit masochistic and I do, the majority of those recalls are due to poor configuration management, poor change management, design failure, variation and deviation in manufacturing process, very few times are they related to someone within the company violating a process. So mm -hmm. what's that mean? From my perspective, it means one, your processes are poor. The way you're designing, communicating, changing and producing product, they're all band-aided. So from your perspective, Nate, when you look at recalls, and this is one I, I want to spend a little time on, when you look at this issue, and I, I think it's it's hidden. I really do believe the recall issue, when you look at the data, we have a major issue. And it, it only takes one recall for a plane to drop out of the sky, a car to uh, blow up or stop on the while it's on the road, or for a, let's say, treadmill. Um to cause injury and to see a company tank overnight. This is a problem. And a lot of companies can survive recalls because they're cash rich or they've got a, a brand that can absorb such a hit. Uh, a lot of companies can't. 
this is an issue. And I, and I know, listen, companies can't just stop producing and designing and change everything. And I always um, relate it to an, an analogy that we have to work with companies as they're driving down the road and we've got to change the tires, change the chassis, change the engine, repaint it without stopping. So from your perspective, you know, one, if you agree that, yeah, recalls are a problem, which I, I think most people would, where should we focus there? So we've gone out of the concept stage. Now we're in that design, getting into production and to as filled it or shipped. What's broken, Nate? Why do we see automotive recalls within the six, seven figures? Why do we see healthcare devices failing? Why do we see baby formula uh, being pulled off the shelves because it's poisoning children? Why are we seeing these types of issues in 2022 when we have the systems, when we have the capability to control that requirements and the production of our of our goods? Well, I think to some degree, so Joe, there's you know there's a lot there, and and I would say, you know, I'm certainly I'm certainly not a litigator. I'm certainly not. Um, you know, I'm not a CEO. I'm not. Um, I'm not particularly good at, uh, or that good anyway, at finance. But I will say, um, to me, you know, you just said, you know, the 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 costs there are, you know, six or seven figures. Well, I think one of the challenges we have is that the profits are in nine or ten figures, and so people are willing to risk the the possibility of that of that quality escape uh, in, in favor of, uh, you know, the profit that the odds are more likely that they're going to make that profit than they are going to have to deal with or pay out on that quality escape. And you can say that's just maybe the laws of big numbers being in your favor, or you can say that, uh, you know, that it's the state of our, of our legal system or the state of our contractual recourse or, or what have you. But I think ultimately the profit that, that people realize outweighs that, that risk. I think that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that, you know, why do we, and this is somewhat related to risk, but you know, why do we have quality management or configuration management or, or auditing or, you know, validation or call it whatever you want, but why do we have those kinds of activities, right? Well, because it's to, at some level, you know, as people and as companies, we are risk averse, right? And over time, we've said, yeah, I mean, there's sort of a moral and ethical thing here that, you know, we don't want to put out products that are going to hurt people. We don't want to put out products that are going to fail all the time. Yet we live in an environment today and we have for probably, you know, ongoing for the last couple of decades that is essentially a, you know, a throwaway culture, right? Uh, the compre you know, the say the compressor pump on your refrigerator goes bad. It's cheaper to buy a new refrigerator than to try to repair it. Um, Unless maybe you know how to do that repair yourself. Um, and then assuming you can get parts, right? Um, that's a whole different kind of conversation. But, but the point is, is that, um, you know, when you're, when you're dryer, clothes dryer stops drying clothes, right? Uh, because the little belt in the back has broken or the little sensor has gone out or whatever, you know, uh, we're fortunate enough these days to have YouTube, right? Because somebody somewhere has probably fixed that dryer before, right? And has walked you through the process. But, but I guess my point is, is that, you know, products today, frankly, aren't designed to live 40 or 50 years outside of maybe a few very specific cases, right? You know, how frequently do we get one of these? Right. Not because it's gone bad, but because the business model of your cellular service carrier says, or at least encourages, you need a new one of these every couple of years, right? right. Um, and so I think some of this actually has nothing to do with corporations or, or technology or what have you, as much as it does how we've evolved as a consumer-based uh, society. And again, not just here in the U.S., but around the world too. I mean, you see this uh, in, in companies and to, or excuse me, countries to varying degrees. And so, um, you know, aligning 
requirements with what is actually produced, you know, is a way to, or I should say, aligning what's actually produced with requirements, I should really say it that way, is, uh, you know, it's, it is a way to enforce quality. It is a way to enforce um, responsibility. It is a way to enforce uh, liability or, or the avoidance of liability. And um, so I think we need to think, we need to think about those kinds of things and those uses for um, requirements definition. Yeah. And, and for those of you uh, that aren't watching this on video, Nate uh, held up his uh, uh, 2002 flip phone. Um, that's a phone he's using <laughs> for his cell service. No, I think I think what I held up was my uh, 2020 version of the of, uh, of my cell phone. And so I, I think, um, you, you know, the, the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, to be fair, you know, organizations do have to make choices in terms of of the kinds of options they can offer, the kinds of, of capabilities they can offer, um, whether they can be profitable at doing it. Um, cause you know, I certainly don't think we're, we're sitting here arguing that, that companies should not make money. Right. I mean, we're not, we're certainly not saying that. And, uh, but yet I think we are saying to some degree that, uh, we might want them to say, be a little bit more uh, responsive to their customers. We might want them to be a little bit more responsible of, uh, of, uh, corporate citizens. Uh, well, I think we, we are saying, though, that, that some of these things that end up on the recall sheet uh, are avoidable uh, with not a lot of extra work or, or, or cost. And so, um, you know, some of this is about changing mindset, about raising awareness, about, uh, to be fair, having stronger penalties when things aren't abided by uh, when they should be. And so um, when we think about how people use technology of all sorts, you know, not just computing, um, you know, unless you're the one making it for your own use, which most of us aren't, um, you know, there have been laws put in place in such a way that, that uh, you know, don't absolve the manufacturer from some level of, of uh, liability and, and responsibility. And so, um, but yet on the, on the other hand, we have to balance that with the fact that we need these companies to make products and, and services for us in the way we, we live our, our society today. And so I think to some degree, we need to, we need to find a, a balance there in terms of oversight and compliance uh, with um, making sure that companies remain viable. Yeah. And, and I want to, circle back to a couple of statements. Um, you talked about risk, right? Managing risk. And, and I want to, you know, add my two cents for what it's worth. You know, I think let's take the automotive industry, you know, we see recalls, you know, affecting 300, 400, a million vehicles, and that's expensive. Um, that's just on a, a recall that actually didn't have a, a negative impact, right? It didn't have an injury or a death associated to it. Um, so you're, you're talking quite a bit of costs. And then if we release a product, um, that does cause injury or, 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 or death, you know, then it's a whole nother ball game of cost and brand reputation. Mm -hmm. But I still believe that's factored in on the risk. And that's just my personal perspective. And my call to organizations and leaders is to stop, you mm -hmm. know, let's, let's take the time, um, to ensure the products we release aren't going to injure or, 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 or cause a fatality. Let's at least, let's at least set the bar there. I don't, I don't think that's yeah. difficult. You know, um, how many times, Joe, how many times have, have we heard people or, or overheard people say, well, we'll just make it up in warranty. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's a good segue to where we're headed. So we've been talking about concept design production. So the time I have an idea to the time I produce it. Now we're, now we're into that. Okay. Now we've, now we've shipped it. We've, we've gone through the logistics of getting our product in the field. Now it's the serviceability. So it's consumption. Mm -hmm. It's one area I, I 
we work from an IPX perspective with companies is they, they're data rich. Most organizations today are data rich, right? As when it comes to their product and service, <clears throat> but they don't actually utilize that data. And one area we're seeing, uh, and again, this actually goes back to requirements and documentation and traceability and communication. So now we've got units in the field and we're getting, and, and as we know now, you get consumer feedback the day it's on a shelf. I mean, we're, yeah. it's feedback, it's live. Everyone knows what's going on, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the defects. That's, that's data. If we were to get that data back into product development, so going back a little bit, but when we just talk about serviceability, the ability to get that service data on the, the warranty issues, the, the updates that were needed in the field, the, the consumer uh, returns, get that into product development and ensure the next iteration incorporates all those issues. I think, I think that would make us a better organization. I know that seems simple to say, and I'm doing it uh, on purpose, but most companies aren't doing that. They're not right. actually taking that fill the data and baking it back in into product development or new product introduction. You don't see uh, a lot of product lifecycle management systems incorporating that data back in. It's it's very much utilized in some ways as a, a PDM on steroids still mm -hmm. at many organizations. But if we enrich those capabilities and those tools and our mindsets, now we have a full cycle or a cycle. Right. Uh, uh, for our organization, I do want to spend some time now talking about the service, the serviceability, that that area of industry, especially in manufacturing from a product perspective. What can we do, um, you know, in your mind, whether it be tools and processes? For me, of course, it's both, right? And I, and I think we're in the same bandwagon there that We've got to update our mindset. We've got to update our tools and our approach there. And how do we marry those? You know, I know this is something you've you've been living for a long time with companies is getting them to marry the idea that you have to have the proper IT framework mm -hmm. with a modern business process framework. Mm -hmm. So from your perspective, how can we approach that? Well, I would say... I would I would finish your sentence around having the proper IT framework and, and business processes with also having the practice that allows them to do that. And, and you know, we we process ourselves to death at times. I think I might have even said this on the last episode that that we like to define processes. Right. Because to put the process down on paper or proverbially speaking is is the simpler part of the task, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. To execute that process consistently and in a way that that meets the requirement and meets our, our ideal operating procedures, that's the harder part. <clears throat> Again, I, you know, and I think I said this part too on the last episode, which is, uh, you know, there's the process and then there's, okay, this is how we really do it, right? right. Well, why not document what's actually done and look at that as an opportunity to update or change your process? Then not only do you have process and practice in alignment, but you also have process and practice in alignment with not only are they aligned, but they are then the coupling of them is aligned with requirements and ultimately align, hopefully, with validation. And so when we talk about putting the product into service and being able to gather information back from that, I mean, you know, there's all kinds of models that people have come up with now for doing that. You know, everything from, say, lower insurance rates by letting, you know, your insurance provider put, you know, uh, or capture the, you know, the, the telemetry on your car to, you um, you know, the the location information and the feed of ads and other localized information based on, you know, where your cell phone carrier locates you from a GPS perspective, right? And and so on. And and 
that being said, those are really consumer level examples of this. And I think in, in the industrial sector where, you know, we talk about airplanes and ships and cars and, and industrial machines, and we talk about, um, you know, even outer space related vehicles and so on, this idea of service of serviceability and, and the connection between requirements definition and, and serviceability, that becomes a much different kind of conversation, I think, because again, it kind of goes back to, to what we were talking about very early on in our episode today is the, the, the idea that um, a product uh, or a platform is not just, you know, this capital asset that we buy now, right? We, we've entered into these uh, kind of contractual arrangements in certain parts of our society where it's not the user of the product who actually has to maintain it. You know, the, the OEM will come and, and maintain it or, or sometimes even maintain it remotely if we're just talking about a software upgrade and such. But when we talk, but in order to do that, right, you mentioned infrastructure and processes that need to be in place. We do have to think about that business model, that serviceability part of the business model when we're defining requirements, when we're establishing infrastructure, when we're doing our design trade space studies and so on for, for ultimately deciding which of the versions or configurations of this that we're going to produce, you know, we have to think about, all right, you know, so how easy is it to service? How effective is it, is it to service? Can we actually work with our customer, regardless of who that may be, to service something? You know, and so, uh, you know, again, for those of us who who are of a certain uh, age, you know, we remember being able to work on cars, right? By, you know, putting the little hanging light there and, uh, you know, why you might, might have been watching your dad or your uncle or your grandfather or somebody, uh, what have you, um, work on that car, right? And And you know, being yelled at for not handing them the right tool. But the point is, is that we used to be able to do that. Um, now, it's not that we can't anymore. It's just, it's become harder because, you know, the packaging of, of, of cars today is much different than it was. You know, and there's a number of other examples of, of, um, of how consumers at one time would service their, their uh, products that they would buy. Right. Whereas today, we're probably much more likely to throw it away or trade it in or sell it or whatever and get a new one versus fixing the one we have. And I think to some degree, while there's certainly changes in, you know, profit models and so on that have driven that, some of that, though, has been by design. You know, there are a lot of companies now these days that don't provide, uh, you know, service parts, if you will down to a certain level of their bill of material structure, right? Well, why is that? Well, because they made a decision that it was not viable for them and in, in, you know, according to whatever metric they used to service individual components, right? You have to buy the subassembly, right? You know, I can't just get the gasket or the washer or the handle or whatever. I've got to buy, you know, 15 parts and I only need two of them. Right. No, and I think that's that's an important statement for our audience to understand. And I think that's going to get more complex, to be honest. If we don't get control and from a consumer perspective on on what we demand of our uh, manufacturers and you know our, our our product designers, but that as ma- maintained process, as you just discussed, I think it's still evolving. You know, I think there's still a lot of room for maturity. And when you couple that with the the end of this life cycle, the as decommissioned um, or as archived from a requirements perspective, but from a, a decommissioned, so how do we recycle? How do yeah. how do we um, get rid of all of this stuff? Because yeah, right? it's not just a physical asset that we're going to recycle. Hopefully we're going to recycle the data. Hopefully we're going to recycle the knowledge. Hopefully we're going to be able to make, you know, version 2.0 or whatever of this, of this product better than the previous version. 
And so it isn't just about, you know, sending it off for the landfill or, or, you know, melting down and reclaiming the metal or the plastic or what have you. But we also want the information that goes along with that or the, the data, if you will, uh, of, you know, the, the life well lived of that product, right? We want to know how did it perform? And, and, and ideally that, that brings us full circle to, to a better definition of requirements, a better, you know, design trade analysis, a better set of production metrics, right? A better, a better, you know, supplier and OEM communication, right? A better interaction with our consumer. Yeah. And I, and I think that's one that honestly is one of those, it's an afterthought at times, you know, Mm -hmm. and pretty much most of the time, honestly, in my experience, and it's, it's, it's concerning, you know, when we talk about battery powered vehicles or really anything battery powered, what's the process and how it's, how's it being communicated to the end user that this is the end of the life expectancy expectancy for your for your product and this is a proper procedure to ensure it's it's taken apart and recycled correctly and that's that's a big fear of mine so um, when we start talking about as maintained as decommissioned understanding those requirements uh, across the supply chain and we're going to get into the supply chain our next series mm-hmm. that could be very daunting and from my perspective we're way behind the mark there yeah. and you know, to use that word evolve again, you know, that's that's a big mantra here at IPX. It's getting organizations to understand it's the time is right now. Um, otherwise, we're going to be flooded with just a lot of stuff yeah. uh, from a product perspective that our consumers have no idea what to do with. And quite frankly, no one knows how to handle and it's going to end up in, in landfill. And we all know where that goes. Right. We've right. We all, we've all seen the cities that are built upon toxic waste and what that does to the ecosystem there from the people, from the the community, from the jobs, it all has a ripple effect. And I do believe this is one area that we need as an organization ensure. And and from a regulatory perspective as well, that our as maintained requirements and our as decommissioned requirements are clear, concise, and valid. Well, I think some of this too, Joe, speaks to just more basic, um, in, in my opinion, more basic um, social levels or social implications is that, you know, we have levels of technology today to do most of the things we need or want to do um, to address some of the social, environmental, whatever kinds of challenges we have. I think what we lack is a willingness as a society or as a people to to make that trade-off right it's it's far easier to just throw it in your trash can and and not worry about it anymore but you know i uh, where we live you know they uh the city put out a uh, a newsletter uh, they put it out every few months and and uh there was a blurb in this last one about recycling and so in our community we have a a mixed recycling scenario where you can put your paper, plastic, cardboard, what have you, into the same bin and somewhere that's sorted. Um, but what they what they commented on was the fact that a lot of um, the the cardboard and the plastic in particular is uh, contaminated with food waste, and you can't, for whatever reason, you can't. Um, recycle that as easily or at all. And so, you know, they made comments about, you know, rinsing out your plastic bottles, right? When all the ketchup's gone or, you know, rinsing uh, or not necessarily rinsing out, but, you know, if you get a, uh, you know, if you order a pizza, right? And there's cheese or whatever stuck to the box, scrape that off in the trash or down the garbage disposal, whatever, and then put the box into the, into the recycle. And so I think, you know, until, we have some behavioral change until we have a willingness to to address some of these things. Um, you know, we can write a lot of requirements, but uh, and we can we can gather this information, we can do all of these things, right? But it comes down to some individual levels of responsibility to do 
the kinds of things that that we need to do on our end of the bargain, so to speak, to to make sure that socially and environmentally and technologically and the like that uh, that things are operating as they should. You know, that's a good one. Uh, you know, I think it's maybe good to wrap up on this. I have a, a good friend of mine, uh, Ron Harvey, says, you know, your your audio needs to match your video. And when you talk about behavior change from a consumer perspective, that's a big deal. All right. And, you know, these OEMs, uh, these uh, manufacturers, they can't force that change. And I think as individuals, that's one thing that we uh, again, we go back to accountability. All right. Mm -hmm. And we say we want the earth to be around for a long time. We say um, we want to do all this work. But do we really take the time? Do we feel like it's too much of a hindrance on my daily operation to scrape the cheese off a a pizza box to rinse out a ketchup bottle. If that's the case, then we, we have some big issues. And I think, mm -hmm. I think we do have some big issues. And I, and I think it's at the same time, you know, the accountability and the behavior change at, at these producers, these manufacturers, you know, how are, how are we shipping our products? Are we shipping is everything our um, product is contained in? Is it all recyclable? Uh, if, if the answer is no, then why not? You know, it's just because we, we want the the optics of the packaging to look good or is it from cost? But what can we do there as well? But for me, um, with everything we've talked about today from operating models, it's does your audio match your video? Are you truly going to invest in an evolution of your organization? So are we going to assess our entire ecosystem? And define who we who we're going to be in the future, or are we just going to keep band aid fixing and compounding problems with the hope that one day maybe technology will catch up and fix everything for us? Um, you know, as we all know, the the room's not going to clean itself, right? That's a right. that's a statement many of us have probably heard for a long time. It's there's there is no jets and robot that's going to come and clean your room for the majority of us. Maybe in the future, that you know, a few of us will be able to afford such. But the reality is. We got to do a lot of work uh, from an organizational standpoint and from a consumer standpoint. Uh, and that's really what I wanted to close on for this. And I know we're wrapping up and we've got uh, a great series ahead for our listeners uh, and for our viewers as well. Nate, want to uh, say thank you again. It, it's just it's a pleasure uh, to join you on this podcast, on this series. Really looking forward to uh, uh, peeling back the onion on some of these things. We've got some really intense things to talk about just from an organization standpoint. We've got supply chain management coming up. And as we know, over the last couple of years, that's the, that whole industry uh, mm -hmm. has, has kind of imploded in some ways. And there's a bow wave of change there uh, from supply chain management and the way we look at um, our supply network. So I look forward to talking about that with you. But Nate, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thank you, Joe. I think it was a great conversation. And and to your point about uh, supply chain, there's there's definitely uh, a lot of work that we can do there, both in uh, employing technologies as well as looking at the way we we use our process and our data. So looking forward to that next time. Thanks, Nate. Thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe and review the show. And for more information on IPX, visit ipxhq.com.